Well, we have the big XFL insider, Mike Mitchell here. I want to thank you so much for taking the time. I, you know, Mike and I talk a lot online, you know, people, and it's always, you know, when's Mike going to come on the podcast? And I had always said, I, you know, all these other XFL shows and podcasts and everything else, hey, we're bored. We call Mike Mitchell. I go, Mike Mitchell, cherish. I'm going to cherish this information. Here we go. You know, big XFL merger talk stuff. I'm going to break the glass today. We're calling Mike Mitchell. Uh, he's making time in his crazy schedule. Mike, thank you so much for coming on. First off, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking, Reed. I it's a it's a pleasure and an honor to be on with you. I also, by the way, appreciated all of my XFL cohorts and all the guys uh, that that uh, co writers with me with the Jets and everything else that I do. I appreciate the fact that, especially with the XFL guys like Josh Davis and Jay Noakes and all these people, Anthony Miller, yourself included, Mark Perry, everybody else, that they don't impose upon me and ask me, Mike, Mike, tell me the truth. Tell me what's going on. Tell me the truth. I've always figure that I'd get those phone calls. Okay. I know, you know, kind of phone calls. So please tell me, I won't tell anybody. So I'm glad you guys haven't uh, done that to me because it's really hard. You know, the, this whole period, time period, this the last couple of years, few years now covering the XFL since 2018, it's hard. Sometimes you get a lot of privileged information and you try very hard not to betray anyone's confidence or trust. And a lot of times my articles or what I say, you have to like read between the lines because I'm trying very uh, uh, it's very challenging to yeah. try to very challenging to try to walk that delicate balance of uh, giving out information and being informative and letting people know what's going on and not betraying the the confidence and trust of others. So, yeah, long overdue. I'm glad to be on Marcast. This is such a great show. You guys have done such a great job. I think you've really shined in these last few months. I think you guys have evolved as a show. You've welcomed everybody on from every angle. You've reached out. You guys are active on social media. I appreciate what you guys do. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I, you know, because because give me info, and I tell you, because know, people send me stuff, and they, I'm like, we're just a commentary site. I mean, whether I hear it from you, you know, a month early or it comes out, I just, you know, I'm not going to talk. You know, we're well. We're, here's the thing. Here's the thing. People don't know about you. You have a background in journalism. Yes. So um, even though you're a commentary site and, and all that, and you guys play nice and you're friendly, you try it best we you try. can. Um, uh, you have a journalistic side to you and you will call people out on their stuff, yes. for lack of a better term. Um, so um, and so I'm mindful of that. You know, sometimes we have conversations. I'm like, you know, I don't want to slip up. I put enough <laughs> pressure on myself as it is. So, and I, people don't realize your background. They just think you're some crazy guy from the Pacific. Just, yeah. Just, uh, you know, <laughs> just some rabid football fan. They don't realize that, you know, you, you have standards. So there you go. All right. Enough of the niceties. We got all that out of the way. Mike, what the hell happened? What, what happened? <laughs> what happened? I thought we were going, what happened? That's my question. Yeah. You know, you know what happened was there, the ownership structure. It's hard getting, it's hard enough getting two people to agree on one thing, let alone you know, nine different ownership structures and the XFL ownership structure. I think the XFL, Redbird Capital, Danny Garcia, Dwayne Johnson, they spearheaded these talks with the CFL. And the CFL was interested because quite, you know, to borrow an old rock catchphrase, they, they smelled what the rock was cooking. They liked what he was cooking. So they liked what the XFL was bringing to the table and what they were presenting. And I think the CFL benefited from having these talks. It's not to say that the Canadian side didn't have a lot of good ideas in these talks, but I think at the end of the day, to answer your question, um, I think they couldn't come to an agreement. They couldn't. They, they didn't uh, arrive in lockstep um, in terms of what they wanted to do. I think some some of the some of the owners, some of the ownership groups in the CFL were a little, a little hesitant to move forward and saw the venture as potentially risky, and so. Um, and they're not a lot of the owners and the community owned teams they're they're not in the business of big business they're localized they don't i'm not trying to be insulting in any way but they don't they're not they're not big picture business people and so trying to get those people to be on the same wavelength um is is difficult so they narrowed down their options they thought that they were headed towards the right direction but you know along the way um they just couldn't get everybody to agree. And I think it wasn't just the CFL side saying, you know, let's pass on this. I think a, a, a big part of this was the XFL saying, well, they're not really on board with what we really need to do. So we got to just end this. 
it isn't going to work. It isn't going to work out. And I think people, you know, the narrative out there hasn't really been painted that way, but that's from what I know from, you know, I, I know people doubt us from what I know, speaking with people inside the, the leagues. And, and I talked to a lot of people on the Canadian side. Um, this, this, this is true. So, so this is why these uh, talks broke off. Yeah. And you know, when, when we talk, you know, small market or, or uh, small picture, it is not a demeaning thing, right? You know, we're, I do wedding videos and I I'll tell our couples, like we are a meat and potatoes company. You got some of these guys, girls, you know, they'll fly all over the world, shoot helicopter, all this kind of crazy stuff. You know, that's not us. And it's okay. It's okay to be a smaller market, smaller focused football team or a football club or league. I mean, like it's not, that's not a, a criticism, even if it, if it's factual, right? You know what I'm saying? Right. I know. I agree with you. And it wasn't just business either. It wasn't a lot of it was strategy. Well, the, the ideas that were coming together, people, everybody wasn't on board with them. So a lot of it was strategy. Some people, some of the owners wanted to do certain things. Some didn't. Some weren't on board. They tried very hard to get that everybody on the same page and on the same wavelength. But at the end of the day, they decided to part ways. The XFL's plans are still in play. They're just going, they're going to go about it a different way now. And so we'll see what happens with the CFL. I'm excited for their season. Um, it's going to be fun watching. I'm so happy for the players, the coaches. That's the thing that gets lost in all of this. You know, people like to paint uh, a brush on, let's just say at XFL fans, they'll say negative things about XFL fans. But I find from my experience, I'm an NFL fan first. I, I'm a huge college football fan. I've been watching football for hard to believe now, but since I was about six years old, so over three decades worth. So um, I think a lot of times people don't realize that the people who watch the XFL support the XFL are the most purest of football fans out there. Yeah. And they watch every kind of football. I mean, they'll, they'll, they love, by the way, they'll watch CFL. They watch indoor league. They've done it for years. I can speak for myself on this. Um, uh, I've watched every single league that's ever been out there. United. I was uh, A week ago, I was watching a United Football League game between the uh, <laughs> Sacramento Mountain Lions and the Omaha Nighthawks, which was their highest rated game ever. And I remember the hope and the promise of that league, and it didn't really quite work out. They decided to play in the fall, but that's neither here nor there. But my point is, you know, uh, I think people like to paint um, XFL forders, uh, supporters with a negative brush. And um, I, I think they don't understand how pure and how, how much these people are so uh, open minded about and have an appreciation for football players and all that. And an appreciation, believe it or not, big time for the CFL, as I do. Yeah, I mean that's the thing is is we would get these Canadian, you know, CFL fans and they would you know, be just like angry. And I'm like, you know, as passionate as you are about your league and rightfully so, I, the XFL people, you know, rightfully so care just as much about their alternative football leagues and stuff. I mean, it's not a, you know, we are both, you know, two mirrors of the same coin. You know what I mean? I have I have so many <laughs> questions uh th th but just so okay, so first off, and, and and this idea has been floated around a lot. So obviously you have your wonderful article at XFL News Hub. You know, we're gonna talk about it in the show and have out some pull out some quotes and stuff. Um Thank you. was this just propaganda as a way to cover the CFL and, and kind of fill this time till they hit the field again? Because it is very odd that these talks went away as we're entering training camp right now. You know, the conspiracy theories are all over the place right now. And, uh, but I'll say this, you know, some of the recent developments might have influenced a couple of the uh, couple of the decision makers in the CFL, single game betting, um, wanting to a little bit hesitant about pushing forward with something that was a more of on a grand scale and wanting to ride this out was kind of a sentiment that I heard from one side. So um, I think the recent developments may have shied certain teams away completely. Um but I, I think there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there right now that are kind of like out, been out there for a while, like the merger term. And, you know, they never even got to that point where they talked about rules and all that. And I can tell you, uh, maybe it's you and I were just two guys here, but I'll just say that uh, if the reverse was in play and we found out that the XFL was going to play CFL style football in America, you and I probably, I know from myself, I wouldn't have had an issue with that, no. but there's a lot of American football no. fans that we know that would have said, this is ridiculous. Why are you doing this? You got to retrofit these stadiums, play American style football. So there would have been, if the story got out there that the XFL was going to play a CFL style, there would have been some backlash on our end, uh, south of the border um, from, from American football fans of why are you playing the Canadian style? We don't care about that league. So I get, part of me gets the sentiment that came from the Canadian side. Uh, part, I'm not saying I agree with everybody's opinions, but I, I understand it. 
So you think that um, these talks were entered into earnestly? I, you know, I know that right early on. I mean, it feels like you know decades ago now. Uh, when all this came out, you know, we had Rod Peterson on the show, and he goes. Uh, CFL is just trying to to milk some ideas from the XFL, right? They're 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 going to do what they're going to do. They think they can get the rocks, whatever. I mean, were these earnest talks? Was it the CFL trying to leech some ideas off? Um, I know that that's been floated around, um, you know, kind of in our chats and in, in in other private messages to me from other writers that we know. These talks were earnest, but it's funny that you say the milk some ideas out of the XFL. There's no question. That both sides, I'm not going to say it's one-sided, but there's no question that the CFL benefited from talking to Redbird and seeing what their the XFL's, they know now. The CFL knows what the XFL's vision is. They know it completely. And the XFL knows what the CFL's looking for from the league and all that. And they provided what they provided in these talks and all that. But it was earnest from the beginning. It was really an interest. It's business. So why wouldn't you be interested in making more money? Why wouldn't you be interested in creating more revenue streams? Why wouldn't you be interested in exposing your product internationally and all over the world and making your product more popular? And so uh, the CFL was certainly interested. They liked what the Redbird was selling in terms of gambling and everything else. That gave them ideas. Uh, so there, so maybe there's some of that came out of this for them, beneficial for them. And I think even in their statement that they released, they talked about how they how constructive these talks were how positive they were and constructive these talks were in terms of innovation and everything else. So uh, they learned a lot from these talks, whether or not they revisit anything in the future, it's possible that they could work on a few things, but I think the XFL is going in their own direction with their grand plan and the CFL is going to try and cross their fingers and hope that, you know, their league model improves and nourishes and gets better over time. Hopefully, uh, this experience makes their league better. And hopefully the Canadian crowds are uh, the ones that show up are certainly going to be appreciative, but hopefully the Canadian market itself starts backing these teams more financially and supporting them. You know, it's one thing to, you know, have a vocal minority online, but when your team's been around for hundreds of years and you can barely get 13,000 fans in your stadium or 15,000 or 16,000 or 17,000 like BC and um, Montreal and Toronto did the last time they were playing. So, um, you got to get to the point where you're, you know, you shouldn't be at a point now with the CFL where um, you've only got three or four healthy franchises. That's not a healthy league. So um, you got to be, you got to get to a point where all nine franchises are strong and healthy and pushing forward. And that's something I wrote months ago on the CFL yep. News Hub. But um, anyway, that's a, that's my feelings on that. So. Um, it, it's, I've talked about it on the show and, and we were, I think we were going to try to do a, a phone call one day, just to kind of chat about this stuff before all this came, you know, my, my belief is, you know, CFL and, and Farhan even talked about this on the, you know, the interview that we published and it's going to be re-aired in this episode that, you know, CFL was feeling maybe a little desperate, right? october time, you know, we got COVID, we're coming off that, we're coming off the money, all these issues. Um, single game sports betting, okay, that passes. And it seems like once that groundswell came, we're like, okay, well, we then we don't need this other money now, right? Like we we can't, as Ambrosi said, you know, in one of the statements, you know, we want a made in Canada solution, right? That we don't need. I mean, is that it, are those connected that as the single game? Because then I heard I heard on the on the opposite that oh well, no, single game sports betting is only going to fuel these partnership talks because it's going to be a stronger league together. But it does seem to me like the second single game sports betting passed and they had this other money coming in that they didn't need the XFL anymore, the CFL didn't. It's a factor, but I think it's a little bit short-sighted if that's what ultimately ended their talks. I can understand the risks. If it's just single-game betting, I'll say this, right? Gambling has been along for a very long time. And so even before it was legalized here in many states as it is now in America and before single-game betting, people who wanted to gamble did gamble uh, for many, many years, uh, decades. So in order for your product to benefit from gambling, your product itself has to be popular. And I'm not saying the CFL isn't popular. It certainly is. It does well. But you, you, you know, you, to benefit from it, every single team has to have strong interest, strong popularity. The sport itself has to be dominant. So, you know, it's people gamble on lacrosse, you know, but, you know, how much money does lacrosse make from that? I don't know. But I'm not comparing to CFL lacrosse. I know a lot of people get upset about that. But, uh, but my point is, if you're just banking on the single game betting, that's a short-sighted view. Um, 
That's well, I mean, but I, I really do believe that. I that I mean, I and you know, we'll, we'll have to see. But I mean, Paul, it's going to help. It's going to help. It's no question. It's going to help. But you know, it depends how you do it. Uh, gambling, what, what it comes down to, is accessibility. There's going to come a time one day when we, you go on the Kansas City Chiefs website and you can bet directly there how many yards Patrick Mahomes is going to have, or bet over two seventy five or three hundred. And once NFL teams make it uh, get to the point where they can legalize it and make it accessible for everybody, I don't care if it's grandma to bet on how many yards Zach Wilson is going to throw for in week one. Um, that's where these leagues are really going to benefit. Um, so it's about accessibility and promoting, and they'll they'll try to do that with different partners. So gambling partners, that'll help. But you need to understand how to streamline it. It's not enough to just talk about it and hope that, you know, Jim, Jim, Jack, and Billy go and bet on your games. You actually have to create an avenue for people to follow where they can put their money down. On, your, on the game. So you have to make it accessible and easy for them. So if they can figure that out, maybe they picked that up from the talks, then yeah, yeah, that, that, that could be beneficial. They're going to lose money regardless this year. Yeah. So, um, you know, because of the situation with fans and all that, they have a shortened season. They've already lost money. We saw Saskatchewan release their figures from last year, the COVID season. They lost whatever it was, 7.5 million, whatever the numbers they released publicly. So uh, it's about improving upon their business model. And if you're just relying on single game betting, my opinion is that's not going to happen. Well, and I don't either, but I I, I do firmly think that that they they think that it's interesting that uh, Hodge, uh, you know, and I know that you and Mark had talked to them. I mean, there's no love loss uh, love loss with us in three down, but. Um, you know, he wrote, Oh, thank God all these XFL talks are done. Now, now we can get back to, you know, adjusting the game as we or you know, building whatever he said, you know, improving the game. I go, what, what was it about talking with the XFL that prevented you from doing all this before? That's what I don't. And like all these people now, and, you know, and, and I could get really, um, you know, I, we try to keep a, a pretty level head on the podcast. I get a little more opinionated on Twitter, but it is like, I don't understand what has prevented the CFL in the last 30 years from doing any of this stuff. That now, okay, well, now we can move on now that these XFL talks are done. Now we can make all these improvements that we didn't do before. Yeah, it's funny because when you think about it, it's difficult to expand your profit margins when you're only a nine-team league in in Canada. It's not like they can go to 16 teams. That's a big part of gambling too, by the way, uh, and fantasy. More more teams you have, more uh, uh, fantasy, uh, more gambling you have, more games to gamble on. Um, So anyway. But um, it's hard for the CFL. So they try to get creative in terms of how they're going to find out, create new revenue streams. So I'm sure they're talking to the Redbird help. As far as Three Down Nation, nothing but respect for anybody who covers football leagues. So I got no issues there. Um, Everybody's got their opinions. I understand where somebody like Hodge is coming from. He's a diehard CFL guy. So he got very defensive during all these talks and he was scared about losing his game. I respect that. Justin Dunk is another person I respect. That that's one of the been of the one of the best things that uh, that I've experienced during this whole process is interacting with the people like Dave Naylor and Farhan Lalji. Nothing but respect yeah. from those guys from a journalism yeah. standpoint. I know there's some people who say negative stuff about them, which is yeah. ridiculous Get to me. There. But anyway, uh, those guys are cream of the crop, and I'm not just talking about uh, just Canada, by the way. So, uh, so that's kind of the story there. So I get it. Everybody's got their own opinions on that. And, you know, it's just the way it is, but CFL needs to, you know, there's not a cure all they need. They, it's going to, it's going to take them time to actually get to the point where all nine teams are strong and solid. And so hopefully they're able to pull it off. I love the league. So I want to see them succeed. Uh, a quote here that you have, and this was in the, your article from XFL News Hub. This was your anonymous source involved with the alignment discussions. Uh, you know, our plan for alignment is so complicated and multi-layered. I feel that all the top decision makers won't sign off on any of our final options. We've exhausted so many possibilities for alignment that will su- significantly benefit both sides, and we have used a- uh, analysis to break down why this would work financially. Still, we keep getting hitting snags in these talks because we can't get everybody on the same page that shares in the same vision. To me, that sounds like we had a bunch of cool ideas. We showed them a bunch of stuff. We showed the analysis of the stuff. We showed them the data of the stuff. We showed them the data on data, and they weren't interested in any of it. Is that, what is, give me some context for that quote. Okay, I'll try as best as I can. It was a little difficult to get clearance on that. So I thank the the individual who who allowed me to use that quote. Does he um, raise his eyebrow like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is he but, involved in Terramon? But I, I'll tell you this, though. Getting all the decision makers to uh, agree uh, includes, um, it's not just a north of the border thing. 
because um, the XFL wasn't happy with some of the ideas that were coming from the other end. And so, and they're part of the reason these talks broke off as well, because they, you know, not everybody was in unison with each other. So, so um, it just didn't work. It didn't work out on that front. That quote is very telling, obviously. And I, your analogy is funny as hell. No question about it. I mean, am I, am I, am I off base that much? By You're not far off. Okay. You're not far off. I'll say that much. I don't, you don't want to go too much further on that. Um, even, uh, I think even as of today, I believe Arash Madani, friend of the show on Rod, uh, Rod's show, they were talking about all this stuff and, and Arash said, you know, uh, basically like what, what did the CFL bring to the table? Right. You know, we know the XFL, we've touted all this, you know, the rock and Redbird and $4 billion, all that stuff. Um, you know, obviously I would say the CFL has, you know, the lineage, right. The history, you know, that kind of stuff in terms of if this was not football related yet, these merger talk or, you know, not more, you know, whatever, if, if they hadn't even gotten to football yet, what business things did the CFL bring to the table as far as your knowledge? That's an excellent question. I think they already have a, um, a global initiative that they were looking into, plans that they've discussed during those talks with the XFL, how they want to expand their product, how they think they can do it together. Um, the XFL has their own global vision as well, so they gave their ideas. Um, I don't know as far as the variance or, or, <laughs> or, or as the variety in terms of business solutions, you know, there there are some ideas shared by different entities involved in those talks that have businesses other where uh, other places. So, um, but you know, overall, I I think it was a little bit um, one sided in terms of um, the multiple options that were presented. Um, I think there was a reluctance to do too much and to put too much on the table, and one side is looking at it from a completely different perspective is thinking about streaming partners and Mexico and everything else. So we'll probably we'll get into that in a minute or so, but that's, uh, that's kind of the story there. So I'm not, tr- I'm trying very hard here. I'm walking a fine line trying here not to be uh, negative or say anything negative, but there are, I'll say this on the CFL side, there are some groups there. There are some owners there that have um, a good history with business and they know about business solutions and, and, and all that. So. Um. I think, and and hopefully this isn't out of step, but I think in in the messages yesterday we shared on the chat, the idea was the CFL is potentially taking hundreds of dollars now when they could have thousands of dollars in the future. There's an argument for that. Well, what is that argument? There's an argument playing going the safe route, you know, going the safe route, not wanting to take the risk. Um, And so that's maybe why these, most likely why these talks are done. It's a business and a strategy thing. It's more than just business. It's also how you strategically want to do things. And, you know, one side wants to, you know, expand upon certain things and another is maybe a little reluctant to do it, doesn't see the value in it, or maybe doesn't have the foresight to see the value in it. Uh, you had, we mentioned here, you know, the international talks and all that. You said maybe we'll hit on it in a minute. So let's hit on that. Talk about the the you know the global vision, or it, I think even in the the XFL statement, which was weird, like they didn't put it on the website. I think they just sent it to like News Hub and Newsroom or whatever. It just seemed weird that they didn't actually. Um, you know, it wasn't like posted on the website. I thought whoever, you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, Danny, if you're listening to this now, let's, let's like, <laughs> let's get that part of an update on. But uh, I think even the statement was talking about continuing the international growth of spring football, right? So uh, w- comment on that. Okay. So there's some questions involved here, and this is currently something that I'm, di- um, a story that I'm digging on right now, but and I've reached out to a few people and asked them questions about this. So I'll present the questions to you. Um, what could it mean to the 2020 markets of the XFL? All right. So I think there's a, ch- there's a chance we could see an alteration there if there's an international element or an addition to the markets that they already had. From what I've heard the last few weeks, Mexico is definitely in play for the XFL. And here's the kicker on this one. What would it mean if, now this might be a little bit troublesome, this net, what I'm about to say. Some, this is like don't hit send in your brain. What if the XFL still explores Canada without the CFL? How would the CFL feel about that? Now, there's some people already that are jumping on the possibility 
I don't know how feasible it is or even possible of CFL teams making the jump. I'm, I'm, res- I'm hesitant to even say that. But um, what if, and I wouldn't rule it out, by the way, the, uh, the XFL, one of their teams in 2023 played in Canada, American style. That's that's something to ponder. I'm looking into all this stuff. I know some of that is speculative. Some of it is what I've kind of heard on the grapevine, but um, I I think it, I think it's a possibility. Both those things that I mentioned. There's going to be changes around the margins to the uh, XFL markets, and whether that's going to be venues, locations, and all that. You could argue that announcing that you're coming back with ten teams would be awesome if you can make that work financially, uh, expand the league a little bit. That might soften the blow for the league not playing in 2022, telling them you're expanding. But I think it's very likely that the XFL is going to be doing something in Mexico. And I also believe that there's interest in doing something in Canada. Now, now what that entails, wait and see. I like that. I, I tell you, you know, as much as we call out CFL homers for, you know, clutching to this, you know, the pro clutching or whatever. I mean, I've said the same thing for the XFL forever, right? That, you know, just because we had like, and, and even still, it's so funny to this day, like Mark Perry and everybody, you know, all the people who were, well, you know, the, we got the XFL draft in October. We got, I'm like, just because they did it one time two years ago, it's like, well, they did, you know, they did the summer showcase the last week in June. I'm like, that doesn't matter. Like, you, you know, I, and I know that we go back and forth with listener Max a lot. And it's like, you know, I remember back, I think a year ago when it's, well, how many, how many of the same original teams are going to return players, you know, for whatever, well, right. spoiler alert, not none of them anymore. <laughs> right. And so, no, I mean, I think that's exciting. Right. But I, I know, um, and I want to obviously get to this too, is the disgruntlement right now with current XFL fans because of all this, right? Because the, right. um, you know, and, and I, I guess I have a lot of questions with that, but, um, in terms of changing, you know, the landscape, uh, I do think that that, you know, might scare some people or not, you know, that, that some of the vision that they had for what the XFL was before, isn't necessarily going to be the vision that, that Danny and the rock and everybody has moving right. forward. Um, did the XFL, just waste the last eight months in these conversations now that we're kicking off in 2023. I've, I, and that's confirmed, right? I mean, we had batted yeah. around that. That's now on the website, but I mean, that's the sentiment I've heard in the last, you know, 28 hours or whatever is, uh, XFL has wasted the last year now doing these talks. And now we're not kicking off for another year. Did they waste this time? I don't think so because I, I, the way I saw it, they weren't going to have a season in 2022 to begin with because of their, their plan. Their plan is still pushing forward. It's just pushing forward without the CFL involved. Um, so I, I think it's tough for XFL fans. And I think it's tough for fans of these leagues, whether you, whether you were a fan of the AAF or the XFL, a lot of these leagues come along and they make grand promises and they fail to live up to them. And they, they tell you about all these great dreams and great ideas they have and what they're going to do. And the AAF was going to revolutionize technology and football. And they were going to have the greatest app in the history of apps and it didn't really work out with them. And then, you know, the XFL wasn't their fault. They had a great league. And then the league ended for the reason that it did because COVID ended it. Um, but I, I think until the XFL proves itself and starts to show hints of being alive, because right now the best way to say it is it's kind of dormant publicly because you don't, it's, you're, they're starting over. It's a league from scratch. They have an awesome team behind the scenes. And there's no question they have the capital and the resources and the finances and the expertise from an entertainment standpoint and and everything else, sporting standpoint to make it work. But until they start making actual football moves, they're not going to be considered a football league until they deliver on the great promise that the, the X, it's going to be hard to match up with the promise of the XFL. For those of you who didn't watch the XFL in 2020, you missed out, but it's going to be hard to live up to the promise that that league showed or to top it. I think they can do it, but it's easier said than done. Running a pro football league is very expensive. Um, and so making it work is not going to be easy at all. But I, I understand the sentiment out there, the people who have doubt. They have every right to have doubt because these leagues have failed before in the past. They've had issues uh, launching, failing to launch. There's so many promises out there that haven't been fulfilled. So the end, you know, just put, pushing the league back to 2023, um, it creates even more doubt until they start making moves. So I think 2022 for them is going to have to be a productive year in terms of news. And a lot of those plans that I've written about, talked about in the past, um, 
documentary shows, everything else that gets complementary to the league that leads up to the buildup um, as a rampway towards 2023, that's going to have to be implemented. You mentioned something there quickly. I just wanted to say this. You mentioned the timeline. I, I talked to somebody yesterday um, close to the situation, and they they hinted to me that we could see the XFL returning in April of 2023, which would buy the league a little bit more time um, in terms of setting everything up that they want to set up. It also gets them out of that window that everybody talks about, March Madness. Um, the Super Bowl is now pushed back anyway, so the XFL would have been starting either late February or early March to begin with, regardless. So I think we could see a little bit of a different timeline, April through June, something like that. Um, now, that, that might be so great in Houston, playing in that heat in Houston in June, but I get, you know, players are tougher than people think they can put up with the elements. So, um, so that's kind of the story there, but there's a lot of layers to this. I get that people are having doubt and until the XFL steps up to the plate and starts swinging, people are going to have their doubts that this league's going to not only uh, make it, but come back and be what it was. Cause I mean, it is. And, and I guess I, 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 we try, if anything on the podcast, to call everything the way it is. You know, if we're critical of fan control football, or we're critical of the spring league, and I'll be critical of XFL. Is you know, it, it does feel a little bit like a joke now. We ch- updated the Twitter yesterday. Now we're XFL 2023. It was 2022. It was 2020 before that. I mean, it is, um, you know, and people already, uh, I think Jake Henry had sent over, you know, there's XFL Twitter accounts made like 24, 25, 26. I'm like, you know, it just, it, it's becoming a little bit of, you know, a joke that way. And, yeah, and, and we've sure. said before, cause obviously, you know, this USFL news coming back. Um, and I, I have a question about that, but the USFL stuff coming back and people ask, you know, why is the US, why can the USFL, this is again, all in theory, you know, why can the USFL launch next year and the XFL can't, right? And, and you've written and we've talked, you know, th- this grand vision, right? And, and and I've said on the podcast, maybe it's too grand, right? Where I think with Brian Woods, like Brian Woods in them, it's like cavemen putting ball on the field. No disrespect intended. Danny and the Rock and Redbird, it's like the Matrix. And we've got layers on layers, and we're it's it's all and, and and I don't know which one's right, right? But 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 you know, and obviously I think the correct answer is maybe somewhere in between, but but is this vision too grand that like, well, we need a year and a half of programming to lead all this stuff out? Like, do we need that? I mean, XFL last time didn't didn't have that, and it seemed like it was doing A-OK before, you know, uh pandemic and everything. All right, that's an excellent point, and I love the way you frame that. The differences between the USFL. <laughs> no and disrespect, the XFL. a friend of the show, Brian Woods, but no, little, I mean, Brian Woods. It's, it's smart, cavemen. you know. It's it's smart too in terms of finances to just if you're looking to run just a football league and present just football. I get that from a financial standpoint. If you're trying to do what Redbird and everybody else is trying to do involved with the XFL right now, that's going to take a lot of coin. I'll say this about Redbird: they don't invest in things unless they they figure to see their profits uh, um, expanded greatly and immensely and multiplied. So they'll put in uh, $500 million uh, as a sure bet that they're going to get a billion dollars back. That's the kind of bet they're making. As far as like the USFL goes with their model, um, I think right now there's so many different rumors about how they're going to handle things, whether or not they're going to have enough time to be in individual markets, whether or not they're going to rely on individual owners. I've heard rumblings about that recently, about potential individual owners for the teams. To, what's that for? To help pay the bills. Um, so that's a little bit alarming sometimes because in the past, Brian Woods with the FXFL, he tried that. The UFL had issues with their owners. Uh, so, so, uh, relying upon, we know about the USFL, everybody talks about the former president, but they had a bunch of owners that had, were flawed and couldn't pay the bills and players had to go to their owner's houses with guns to get their money. And, and owners were hiring their farm hands to be the punter and all kinds of stuff. So there was that UFL basically didn't have any money to, uh, to, uh, give their players equipment and rolling and, uh, uh, and, uh, athletic tape and everything else. So anyway. But um, I think the USFL also, there's a lot of doubts about them making it work because once you open up that cash register uh, and start to operate a genuine pro football league and pay your players and all that, then uh, the, the bills start coming in and you got to pay them. So, um, so we'll see how it goes. I'm, I'm, you know, I think they have a chance. They're, the name USFL has some goodwill and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they do. They're going to have to promote it, market it better than they did the spring league. 
and they're gonna have to put more money into it to make it work and have to, it's gonna have to be legit in every way possible so uh, i'm rooting for them again it would be interesting to see how they how they do and it's great for players if the usfl and the xfl is on the market there for sure did the usfl announcements play any factor at all into anything else that was happening i know we had talked offline you know, were they, uh, were Redbird and Danny and the Rock, you know, were, were they shocked by everything? I mean, what, uh, what factor of any did that play and were they stunned by this announcement or not? Uh, they weren't stunned at all. Matter of fact, the people I spoke with were complimentary. They thought that, um, the USFL showing up on Fox and being in that space shows how viable football is in that time period. So I was surprisingly, there were the, um, the conversations that I've had, there weren't, there weren't any kind of remarks that were like, um, you know, down putting or kind of putting their nose in the air or trying to say anything negative about it. I didn't hear anything like that. I don't think any, none of what the XFL is doing right now has, uh, has anything to do with the USFL. I don't think they're concerned. They're, 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 they have a different operation. So, um, and so uh, when they unveil that, I mean, they were going to, they were, they're going to, they were going to play in 2023, regardless of what happened with these CFL talks, whether they aligned, whether they didn't talk with any of that. So, um, so that's kind of what people are not really focusing in on. So the fact that the USFL is coming back on the marketplace in 2022, 2022, it's not, doesn't mean all of a sudden the XFL is going to say, you know what, we're coming back in August of next year. We got to get back out there. They're not going to rush back into the market. They're, they're, they're being very methodical in their approach. And, so we'll see. We'll see if they play. We'll see if, you know, maybe the XFL is wrong for not considering them more of a threat. We'll see. But um, but I, I it doesn't change their vision or their plans at all. So do you feel that they were on a path? The XFL was on a path to a 2023 launch. At some point that changed since. I guess when did the announcement get made? August. Right. We're coming back in 2022, like right. late, late August. Right. Um, yeah, August was the when they purchased the league out of bankruptcy, and then I want to say, and I could be wrong on this, so pe- you can correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, October, I want to say, is when they announced, okay, here's when we're coming back because we had a little bit of that period, yeah, in yeah. between them announcing the 2022, where people were pushing for a 2021 season, believe it or not. Yeah, and here we here we are waiting for 2023, but there were people talking about, hey, let's hub it, let's put them in one stadium, let's put them in Houston, let's do this, we'll work around COVID, all that. So, um. For a while there, 2021 was in play, at least in the minds of people. Yeah. And then they announced 2022. So uh, from everything I've heard, they weren't quite ready to go. And, and like, you know, even before these talks happen, and then these talks definitely push them more towards, you know, steering away from rushing out there in 2022, if that was ever an option in their heads. They want to do this right. I think when you only get a second chance to make a first impression. And I understand this is the XFL under its third iteration, but this is Redbird Capital and Danny Garcia and Dwayne Johnson's first venture into a sporting league. So they want to get this right. So uh, they want this to be a smashing success. Whether or not they'll be able to pull it off remains to be seen. But uh, 2023 was the likelihood all along. Is you know I, I know people don't like to hear that, but that's just the way it is. So with these talks and everything, it did seem like, and, and and not that the CFL was very vocal, but I feel like they were, you know, and it helps to have Commissioner Ambrosi, you know, be a little bit more of a public figure right now, right? Uh, but but even like, you know, as of yesterday, you know, the XFL website, you know, they give these statements out to the to the media. You know, there's the the video is redone, but it just says 2023 now at the end, which I think is a really bad look. I mean, you know, some of these things, but why why not do something to to be a little more public out facing, even if there's nothing to talk about right now? Uh, you know, there's an argument for that, no question about it. I think right now they don't have to be honest, they don't have anything to announce. So that's really the story there. And they didn't expect this. To, they didn't expect these talks to fall apart at this point. They thought that they thought they were, they were going to head. They narrowed down their options. They, as I mentioned in my article, they narrowed down their options. They were look, they were getting close. And so, but things kind of broke off towards the end there. Not everybody could agree upon things. And so, yeah, it would be beneficial from a public image standpoint for them to uh, be a little more active, but until they actually have some meat on the bone, for, for, for everyone to, to, to look into and to be interested in, 
they could have handled the situation a little bit better, how they announced it on, on social media and everything else. It made it created the appearance that maybe they were floored by uh, this news and, you know, they didn't expect it. I know a lot of people expected that by year's end that they would announce what they were doing with the CFL. And then they would, at that point, they would announce that 2022 is off. So it seems kind of, kind of forced and that in in June, where are we now? July, <laughs> in July, in July, that uh, we found out on the way that we did. Um, they're going to have to do a better job moving forward of presenting a public face and image. You know, a lot of people get the impression that Danny Garcia and Dwayne Johnson, are, you know, they're not really talking about the league. They're not promoting it. They're not really saying that much about it. Little dribs and drabs here, every once in a while, of a mention here. I mean, it's gotten to the point where people look for weight belts and. Uh, from The Rock and his videos, whether or not they say XFL on them. Danny, every once in a while, will, you know, tease people with some information. Some of that has come out. Jay Rothman and, you know, we found out about BCG. They were involved in the CFL talks. So, yeah, they need to do a better job moving forward. I mean, when they're ready to go, when they're ready to put the keys in the ignition and make their announcements, they're, they, you would expect them to be front and center every day on social media, promoting everything heavily. Once they put the keys, I don't think they're ready yet to put the keys in the ignition. Uh, I just looked at the clock here. I was like, we've been going. So I, I promise not to hold you up too much. Longer. I was like, oh my gosh. I just looked <laughs> at the clock here. I've been so engrossed in the conversation. Um, thank you uh, for your for your time. You're welcome. And, and thank for, you. Um, can we dissuade the speculation that there is a a trove of coaches and and staff and everybody hired right now that i you know i think i tweeted a couple weeks ago this isn't going to be like the ending of national treasure when they open up the treasure vault and there's all of these you know because you know and we get that a lot and again this is what you know and and i've you know i reached out to the to the xfl media people you know they they've talked to us and you know when all like the we're going to be on the field in months and then that all you know they're they're like i go yeah, I, I understand that that you know you don't have anything to announce or you're taking your time or whatever, but like, you know, one day in social media is like a year of of anything now, right? And the silence is deafening. I think uh had they been more uh uh upfront about these talks from the beginning and said like you know, there is no merger or whether, you know, because think of all the speculation we've done in the last four months, right. For literally nothing, right. Like literally nothing at all. Nothing came of anything. There wasn't anything. And I'm like, God, if anyone would have just said like, Hey, actually, you know, this is not what we're doing or this isn't like if Danny Garcia had come out and said, well, actually I, I meant months as in like, we're still a long way away. Not as in we're in months as in like, we're kicking off in three months, which is how I read it. But I mean, at least at a minimum we can dissuade, right. There's no treasure trove of, of coaches and everybody that's sitting idly waiting for a launch yeah we, we can definitely put that to bed I, you know everyone will start focusing on 2023 now and they'll talk about but i even a couple of weeks ago people reached out to me some of my colleagues reached out to me and said hey what have you heard mike i hear 2022 is a go now and they're, they've already got coaches the coaches are telling me that they're coming back and it's already set up and uh you know i, I had to shoot that down quickly um yeah, you know, I get it. You know, you have so many. It's great, though, that a league that only played five weeks has so many people that are interested. Crazy. In it. It's crazy. It's, cra it's, it's crazy. crazy. The league, only, it tells you something. If you're an outsider and you're wondering what the hell, it tells you something. A lot of the XFL supporters were not even alive for the first iteration um, or were too young to even remember it or didn't watch it. And so it's pre HD era television. So, I mean, uh, so that that's that there's that. So there it's great that there are so many supporters of the league that are still interested in it and that are, you know, doing detective work every day, going on LinkedIn and finding phony XFL employees or all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, everyone is out there looking for any slight change that's on social media. What does this mean? What does that mean? Uh, so, I mean, that's great. I, I, but yeah, it's just funny. You know, we had a, I mentioned this at the open of this interview and I know this has been pretty lengthy, but there was, it, I can't respond to every single thing that people say to me on Twitter that opens up a can of worms. Sometimes I'm, you have some privileged information. I can't say anything about it, but anyway, there was one response that I got on Twitter from, uh, one of my followers and he follows you as well. And he asked me to like his tweet. Yeah. It to it to identify whether or not there would be no 2022 season. So what did I do? I went in his DMs and I sent him four separate messages, and they were the letters L I K E. 
So that's <laughs> so you couldn't hold me to it. So, but I appreciate the fact that fans like that are out there and that they still care about this league. It's almost to some people nonsensical that a league played only five damn weeks and still has people almost two years later or whatever it is now, year and change later that are like, I can't wait for this league to come back. When's it coming back? That should tell you something right there. Um, what is next Moving forward here, whether whether we were XFL fans, we've made it, you know, 55 minutes in the Mike Mitchell interview here. We're, we're anxious. We're ready to go. XFL news. Uh, what what is next? I think by the uh, by the end of the year, they're going to have to make a, a significant announcement. That's my opinion. Um, now they can wait till the new year and announce what we're doing in 2022. But I think the, we, whatever plans they had, the, you know, they're they're moving forward and they're going to need to start pr- putting the wheels in play. And I think as we move along in the fall and in the winter, I think I know that's another long way for people. That sounds like a long way away, but um, I think we're going to need to start hearing news about what the league's plans are for 2022 leading into 2023. So whether that be documentary shows, whether or not that be new teams added to the league, whether or not be a couple of relocations in the league, two teams, maybe moving to Mexico and Canada, so, I mean, whatever it is, the, the international side is in play 100%. And that's going to be in play for 2023. How that's rolled out exposure-wise and expansion-wise remains to be seen, but that's going to be in play. But until we start seeing big news, people right now have a lot of doubt, and rightfully so. And so I think in the next few months, we need to, we need to start you know, hearing some um, important inf- and vital information that shows you that the league is alive and pushing forward, whether that be the hiring of a CFO or whatever it may be. They need to start putting the wheels in motion and putting their league together. Yeah, I think um, when, it, when it all comes together, I think it will be you know tremendously exciting in the meantime. But it is, and, and, and I do, and like I've said, and if anyone you know cares about my opinion at all, but I do talk about this quite a bit, but uh, you know, that vision, you know, I've heard this, you know, documentary shows and we're doing, the, like, I don't, like, I don't know that that's, I don't know if people want a year's worth of, you know, it's 30 for 30s lead. I don't know. I mean, all I know is, you know, the XFL the first time it had, I mean, wasn't great. I mean, they obviously the social media and, and Bailey and all that, you know, did a good job. But I mean, I remember, you know, I think we had Ryan Gustafson handing off uh, season ticket boxes or whatever to random fans <laughs> in Pioneer Square for the Dragons. And I was so angry that I, I knew they were staged because I had one of the first season tickets and I was so angry that I didn't, um, you know, get one of those. But, you know, I, I think there, 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 there's a line in between those two things, but I do wonder that like, we keep saying like, we're, you know, we're preparing, we're preparing, they're getting all these things. I'm like, I don't, you know, are we packing for a trip with 16 suitcases? Like, I just don't know. I get that it's a big launch, but I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it's fascinating to me. We have this slow rollout maybe of the, of, um, USFL, you know, it was it was the spring league and the hubs and we're expanding and what are we doing? And then I think like the XFL wants to shoot its load at one time, right? That's like, here's our plan. And and I just don't know which one is right. And I'm fascinated to see because it is like we're seeing two, you know, a mirror image here back and forth. We might get what I thought we were gonna get in 2020, which is the existence of the Alliance of American Football and the XFL at the same time. Be fascinating. The fingers crossed that both these leagues make it and do a great job. So I think it's great for players because when you're talking about it, if you've got two leagues with 16 teams, you're over 800 players at the bare minimum. So getting jobs and that's coaches and then people working for the teams and then that's people getting media jobs working. So it's great for football if it happens. So it is going to be fascinating to watch the march towards that. I'm very I'm curious how the USFL makes things work. And uh, and what they do, what markets they choose, what coaches they're hire. There's rumors out there about guys like Steve Spurrier and Wade Phillips and Jerry Glanville and others. You're going to have to pay those guys decent coin and make sure those checks don't bounce. Um, So, you know, that's kind of the story there to get those kind of guys that would help for notoriety. But um, yeah, they could be battling each other there, the USFL and XFL. So uh, we'll see. You have to get to the point where you actually pay your players decent money and and all that for for players to want to play in your league. So anyhow, but uh, yeah, it's going to be fun to watch. We got to be patient here with everything, but it's going to be fun as we start rolling closer towards 2022 to see what happens.
Yeah. Uh, well, I, Mike, this has been, uh, we, you know, I, I will send him. I'm sure Paul is having a heart attack right now as I send him the <laughs> audio file of this as we get going. But, you know, this was a long time coming. We, you know, we were going to have you on because I kept saying, like, we'll have him on when there's news. And then it was like, the actually found that really did anything. And so now we, I mean, at least we have. So I'm glad that we uh, we got the Band-Aid off. You know, the, the toothpaste is out of the tube now. We can have you back on again in the future. But uh, it was certainly not for a lack of us talking anyway, just that actually, you know, finalizing and getting stuff on here. But I really appreciate an hour of your time here uh, spending with us today on the Marcast. Thanks, Reed. You guys are awesome. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Uh, there you go.